Hey, he is risen. He is risen indeed. What a week it has been. We started off last week, Sunday, with a meal in honor of Jesus at Simon the leper's house, where Mary, the sister of Lazarus, poured very expensive oil with perfume in it over the feet of Jesus and wiped it and cleaned his feet with her hair. Then we saw the Sanhedrin decide that due to Jesus resurrecting Lazarus, uh, that the final straw had happened and Jesus had to be destroyed. Jesus then is seen riding into Jerusalem on a donkey, a symbol of peace. On the Thursday, Jesus gathered his disciples for the Last Supper, where he gives a new command to love one another as he loves us. He then went into the Garden of Gethsemane for a time of prayer because he knew that his appointed hour had come. He asked God during that time of prayer if there was any other way to save the people, to let it be. But if this was truly the path that must happen, Jesus would drink of the cup the Father had left before him. He then knew that the arresting team had arrived, took his disciples, and went to meet the arresting team, where Judas Iscariot kissed Jesus to show the arresting team which man they were after. As they went to seize Jesus, Peter draws a sword, cuts the ear of Malchus off, and we see the last miracle Jesus will perform while on earth. He takes the ear and attaches it to Malchus. The Sanhedrin arresting team sees this act and chooses still to disbelieve. He was tried by the Sanhedrin, primarily tried by Caiaphas's father-in-law, the former high priest, where their initial charges were about his teaching. Jesus quickly points out that there were many that would testify to Jesus's teachings. And he also quickly pointed out that those that were bringing charges against him, the Sanhedrin, had never once set foot in the temple or a synagogue to hear Jesus teach. Well, they realized that they were kind of backed into a corner and had to get the help of the Roman government. So they took Jesus to Pilate, where after questioning Jesus, Pilate makes it very clear to the crowd and to the Sanhedrin that he finds no fault with Jesus. Pilate's wife even begs him to not cave to the crowd because she had a dream and suffered tremendously because of that dream of the innocence of Jesus. Pilate shows how even as a Roman official, he was a coward. He gave to the masses screaming for the release of Barabbas. Jesus was then sentenced to death by crucifixion. He was taken away, stripped of his clothes, flogged, beaten severely, then hung on the cross. While on the cross, there was a thief on either side of him. And he said, as one of the thieves cried out for him to remember him, Jesus said, you will be with me in paradise today. With Jesus's final breath, he utters his final three words. It is finished. And he gave up his spirit. As the Passover was just three hours away, Joseph and Nicodemus, who were secret disciples of Jesus, claimed the body and quickly put just enough oils and spices on him and, layer, and a layer of linen to be able to place him in the tomb. 
Now, these two were secret disciples because they were actually also members of the Sanhedrin, you know, the group responsible for Jesus's death. Just before sunrise, on that first Easter morning, Mary Magdalene goes to the tomb to finalize the burial as the normal way of Jesus's burial was rushed due to the coming of the Sabbath. She arrived at the tomb to find the stone rolled away and Jesus's body gone. She quickly flees to Peter and John, two of Jesus's right hand disciples and tells them that his body is missing. Both quickly ran to the tomb to see for themselves. John arrived first, but would not go into the tomb he just looked around. Peter got there, didn't care about the risk of defiling, nothing. He went right in to see what was going on. The linen was not out of place, but the body was gone. John quickly believed a miracle had taken place, but Peter, not so much. They left, Mary returned. When Mary returned, two figures were sitting at the head and the foot of Jesus, appeared to be angels. Then Mary, sitting outside the tomb, began to weep. When she was asked by someone she thought was maybe a gardener, why are you weeping? Mary begs this gardener to tell her where her teacher was so that she could go and get him and finish the burial. When all of a sudden, the only thing this gardener uttered was Mary. In an instant, Mary knew the voice. She looked up and yelled, Rabboni, meaning teacher. Her eyes may have deceived her, but her ears did not. She realized that by the sound of his voice, her teacher was right in front of her. She then understood that he had indeed risen and it was instructed to go and tell the others. Our scripture today comes from the Gospel of Luke, the 24th chapter, verses 36 through 53. It reads... While they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and frightened, thinking that they saw a ghost. He said to them, Why are you troubled? And why do doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands and feet. It is I, myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones, as you see I have. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they still did not believe it because of joy and amaz amazement, he asked them, do you have anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish and he took it and ate it in their presence. He said to them, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. He told them, this is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. And repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. You are a witness of these things. I am going to send you what my father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with the power from on high. Then he led them out of the vicinity of Bethany. He lifted up his hands and blessed them. While he was blessing them, he left them and was taken up to heaven. Then they worshiped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And they stayed continually at the temple, praising God. We're dealing with two very different types of faith. There is a faith that needs to have a, an assurance. Um, and there's another faith that needs to share a firsthand experience. 
Now, the first type of faith, the assurance faith, uh, it paints this picture that we need Jesus to almost be right by us like a protective parent, a protective friend, a protective sibling, when we're terrified of what is happening around us. So anytime we're feeling fearful or anxious or confused, or we're dealing with the sinfulness that comes with our human nature, Jesus stands with and among his people. Knowing Jesus is standing with us, we have this reassurance that we are loved, that we have peace, even when dealing with difficult situations. Jesus has this ability of calming any situation in a world that can be very cruel and chaotic. He takes it upon himself to bring us peace, hope, when we feel trapped inside our own little bubbles. After all, he came to his disciples saying, peace be with you. The other faith that's kind of hinted here is this faith that requires a firsthand experience. And I often kind of refer to this as the Thomas faith. And what I mean by that is out of all of the disciples, after Mary fled and told the disciples what she then experienced at the tomb after Peter and John left, the disciples were talking as they were walking back to their house. There were conversations. They were starting to go, maybe this is happening. Maybe he did rise. Thomas is the one disciple that really was like, you know, until I can put my finger in his hand and put my fingers in his side, feel where he was nailed to the cross, feel where the spear stabbed him in the side. I don't know how y'all even think this is right. Jesus appears to them and invites them to handle his body. Invites them to make sure that <clears throat> his physical resurrected body was indeed real. Jesus went as far as to eat with them. And this part of our scriptures cracks me up because it is the like the most human side we see of Jesus. Jesus is going, how am I going to get these guys to figure out that it's actually me? I'm not a ghost. Hey, y'all got anything to eat? That's his, he's like, let me have something to eat. I'll prove to you that I'm real dead. He sits there and eats right in front of him to show that he is indeed real and resurrected. The disciples were not convinced he rose from the dead, but that, but at the same time, it's kind of hard to argue with what they're seeing right in front of their face. The joy of his potential resurrection filled them, yes, but part of them thought this has got to be too good to be true. Those who believe without seeing are truly blessed. Maybe there is a need in the world for us to strip the clothing that comes with this religiosity, this strong religious feeling or faith or belief. If we were to do this, if we were to strip away the extreme religious feeling or the extreme religious beliefs, we might have a chance to encounter receive, and even come face to face with the risen Lord in a newfound nakedness and allow him to come to us, allow us to be humbled in front of him that he may clothe us in the faith that we are supposed to have. We need to get out of our own way. We need to look at our priorities. Where is God in our life? Are we clothed in God or are we clothed of the world? Are we praying to seek the solutions God has for us or are we pulling the coward pilot way and taking the easy way out? Faith should be inspired by the resurrection. Our faith 
should result in a continual want to praise God. The message of Easter is a difficult one to hear, but it truly is a simple one to understand. We as a body of Christ are loved so much that Jesus died at the hands of religious men to save us. Jesus allowed for egos, for authority, for power trips and power struggles and dismissal of God's teachings to be the reason that he had to die on a cross, the most humiliating and painful death possible. People who were crucified were done so to send a warning message. It was to make a mockery of them and to warn others, this is what will happen. Through his sacrifice and his teachings, we now have a duty. It is up to us to walk alongside one another, walk along a path filled with prayer, to be the voice of love and justice and freedom, because that is what Jesus died for, for us to be free of our sins and allow us to have a brand new chance every day. Jesus led his disciples out of the vicinity of Bethany. He lifted his hands up and he blessed them. And as he blessed them, he was lifted and he ascended to heaven. But he did not leave his disciples without providing them what they needed for their future. He instructs them to stay in Jerusalem until they are clothed with the power of God. He doesn't leave them until they are under the protection of God, which happened through the blessing he bestowed on them. These same disciples that Jesus came and blessed and clothed with God's power, clothed with God's protection, were the same disciples that the minute Jesus was arrested, vanished. From the time of Jesus' arrest to the time Jesus rose from the dead, the only thing we know about his disciples is that Peter denied him three times and Judas took his life. Jesus could have held a grudge that those he loved, those he trusted, those he taught fled and deserted him. He could have appeared to anyone else, but he came back to his disciples, those that made the mistake of not being there for him. And his first words are, peace be with you. He didn't judge them by their past, but judge them by what he knew they were capable of doing in the future. Do you own your past? Are you a person judging someone by their past? Are you a person that wants things a certain way or gets frustrated because things just aren't good enough? Are you a person who is prayerful in the ways you choose to handle your life? Are you a person willing to accept someone who is different than you? Jesus died for the sinners, the outcasts, the unclean, Jesus rose after his death and appeared to his disciples, the very ones that were nowhere to be found during his flogging and crucifixion and greeted them with peace be with you. Jesus didn't hold a grudge or a judgment because of their choices in his final hours. Jesus came to them with love and acceptance, giving them the power and the blessing that they needed before he ascended to heaven. So the question this Easter Sunday is, are you willing to do the same for others? It's up to us. 
I hope all of you have an amazing Sunday and an extremely happy rest of your Easter day. God bless all of you. See you next time.